Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the second generation antipsychotics. Now, if you guys don't know, we have already covered the first gen antipsychotics in our previous lecture. So you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine, where you can find playlists for the USMLE Step 1, both psychiatry and pharmacology. And in those playlists, we have discussed the first generation or the typical antipsychotics. So I highly recommend you check that out. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel because we're going to be posting brand new videos for Step 1 regularly. So let's talk about the second gen antipsychotics, aka the atypical antipsychotics. There are several that you need to know, but luckily there is a very easy way of remembering these drugs. Okay, So the first drug that you need to know is called aripiprazole. And this one really isn't going to conform to any suffix pattern, but you just need to memorize aripiprazole. And now the rest of the drugs are going to fall into one of two uh, uh, patterns. right? So the first pattern is going to have a suffix of A, P, I N E, the apines, which is uh, these drugs right here, which are these drugs like clozapine, olanzapine, quitapine, and acenapine. So these are going to be your apine antipsychotics. And then the last one are going to be the I D O N E, idone antipsychotics like iloperidone, paloperidone, risperidone, lurazidone, and ziprazidone. So these are going to be all of your antipsychotics. So I highly recommend for second gen you memorize the apine, the idone suffixes, and then just memorize aripiprazole, and you'll be able to spot any of these drugs very easily. Now, when it comes to SGAs, these are going to be able to treat everything in FGA, the first-gen antipsychotics, treat, with the exception of schizophrenia. First-gen antipsychotics only treated, let's just write this down, first-gen antipsychotics only treated the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, okay? Of uh, uh, schizophrenia. Let's write this. All right. When it comes to second gen antipsychotics, you're going to treat both the positive and the negative symptoms. So therefore, in theory, this is a much better drug to use for treating treatment of schizophrenia, not just for this reason, but for also the other side effect reasons that we're going to talk about in a second. And you can also use this for OCD. So that's one main difference between first gen and second gen. It's going to be the positive and negative symptom treatment for schizophrenia. You can also use these for bipolar disorder, delirium, Tourette's and Huntington's, and psychosis, kind of like the same as the first gen. Now, one defining feature, and this is very important, the defining feature between first generation and second generation antipsychotics is going to be decreased uh, EPS or the neurologic symptoms that occur with the high potency first gen antipsychotics. Okay, this is very high yield, high yield as fuck in my opinion, because you can be tested on what the defining feature between these two drug classes is, and it's the fact that you have less neurologic symptoms occurring with the second gen. Now, when it comes to mechanism of action, we do not know exactly what's happening with second generation antipsychotics. What we do know is that you have the blockade of the postsynaptic D2 receptors that also occurs in uh, first generation antipsychotics okay, also have this. So it's the same mechanism. So just to review, if you guys haven't seen the previous video, uh, we have two main dopamine receptors you need to know about. D1 receptors activate adenylocyclase and, re increase and lead to an increase in CAMP, cyclic AMP, and the D2 receptors deactivate this uh, adenylocyclase and lead to decrease in cyclic AMP. Now, when you inhibit the D2 dopamine receptors, like you do with second generation antipsychotics, what's going to end up happening is you're going to have decreased D2 act, uh, binding, right? Because you're inhibiting it, which is going to lead to an increased D1 receptor binding and eventually, oh, bing, <laughs> binding, there we go. Uh, and that's going to lead to increase in cyclic AM. So therefore, these drugs inhibit D2 and act like a D1 agonist in a sense. Now, one thing to understand is because you have increase in cyclic AMP, this increase is going to have a negative feedback on our brain, and it's going to lead to actually decreasing our dopamine levels. Okay, Overall, you're going to have a decrease in dopamine. That's very important. Now, when it comes to uh, what's actually happening with first-gen antipsychotics, it's the fact that these first-gen antipsychotics is are increasing cyclic AMP, 
in our brain. That's what's happening. That's the actual effect. It's not decreasing dopamine levels. It's increasing cyclic AMP by, by having a, an increase in D1 receptor binding. Now, these drugs also tend to block uh, the serotonin 2A receptors as well. And that's very important because often these receptors, the serotonin 2A receptors, are hyperstimulated in schizophrenic patients. And hyperstimulation of this receptor leads to increased hallucinations, right? So you want to reduce that. And in schizophrenia, that's one of the hallmark signs of schizophrenia is hallucinations, especially auditory hallucinations. So one way you can do it is by giving the second-gen antipsychotics. And by blocking the HT2A receptor, the serotonin-2A receptor, you're going to decrease the hallucinations that are occurring in the schizophrenic patients, okay? That's what's going to end up happening. You're going to decrease hallucinations. So these are the two main uh, uh, mechanisms of action. Keep in mind, this really does not occur in first-gen antipsychotics this does this is definitely what uh, the d2 receptor d2 dopamine receptor blockade is what occurs in the first gen so this is also another uh, defining feature now, we're going to talk about all of the adverse side effects of the second gen. And there are several adverse side effects, and most likely for step one, you're going to be tested on these side effects. So the first side effect we're going to talk about is the metabolic syndrome. Okay, now this can happen with any antipsychotic class, but it often happens with the second gen antipsychotics. Okay, this is very important. The second gen antipsychotics are more likely associated with metabolic syndrome. So what you're going to see is in these patients, they're going to present with weight gain, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, and you're going to see they're getting a little bit fatter since they've been taking their medication. So the way I used to remember this is uh, by thinking about a fat pine, right? Apine, because these are the second gen antipsychotics, specifically like clozapine and olanzapine, uh, these are the ones that are going to cause uh, increase in the metabolic syndrome. And I just put fat, so that's how I remembered it, because these patients have symptoms of just becoming fat. So that's the memory tool I use. That's one side effect, metabolic syndrome. There's a specific drug that you need to know out of all of these second-gen antipsychotics, and it's not because of what it, uh, what the mechanism is, but it's because of the side effects, the negative side effects of this drug. That drug is clozapine. Clozapine is a very, very strong drug that's used for, for uh, schizophrenia, but it has a lot of side effects. And because of these side effects, it's usually not the first line or second line drug. It's going to be used for treatment resistant schizophrenia. And that's how they're going to phrase it in step one. Okay. So look out for a patient who's on like a fourth or fifth line drug or a third line drug who's been treated with other antipsychotic drugs but it hasn't been successful, so now they're put on this other drug. What ends up happening in these patients who are taking clozapine is that they're, they might present with bone marrow toxicity. So neutropenia and agranulocytosis can occur in 1% to 2% of these patients, and that's very important because that is something you will be tested on if you get a question about clozapine. What are the side effects? What can happen? So this is very, 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 very important. Clozapine is associated with neutropenia and agranulocytosis. Now, because of this, you need to monitor the neutrophil count weekly. And these patients are also going to become very susceptible to infection. So you need to make sure if they're running a fever, you've got to make sure nothing's wrong. They're not really getting sick. Now, you also need to monitor their white blood count overall. And this is all reversible once the drug is stopped. So that's the first thing. Clozapine, you need to know it can cause a granulocytosis, and they'll present this by asking you what laboratory uh, exam should be done with clozapine, and that's going to be uh, a either neutro monitor the, the neutrophil count or white blood count overall. Okay, you're looking for neutropenia and a granulocytosis. Now, you can also have seizures, which are more common compared to bone marrow toxicity, which occur, the, these seizures are going to occur 2 to 5% of the patients, and myocarditis or cardiomyopathy. This is also high yield, but in my opinion, if you're going to try to remember one of these two things, remember this right here, the side effect of the neutropenia and uh, the agranulocytosis, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, and seizures are also something that can happen with clozapine. Just don't forget it. Okay, so that is clozapine. Now, there are still more adverse side effects that you need to know about when it comes to these second-generation 
uh, antipsychotics. And the second, the main one is going to be endocrine issues, the next main one, right? So these uh, endocrine issues occur because uh, usually these drugs are going to affect the tubulo infundibular uh, pathway or tubular infundibular system. And this is one of the main four dopamine pathways in the brain because normally dopamine is released by the hypothalamus to inhibit prolactin. So when you have dopamine, right, so you have dopamine, you're going to have a decreased prolactin levels. That is normal. Now, what ends up happening is because you have decreased dopamine levels due to blocking the D2 receptor, uh, D2 dopamine receptor, you're going to lead to hyperprolactinemia. Why is that? Because you are blocking the D2 receptor, you're going to have more positive D1 stimulation, which is going to lead to increase in cyclic AMP. This increase in cyclic AMP is going to lead to a decrease in dopamine. And because you are decreasing dopamine, this is all going to lead to hyper prolactin levels, right? So that is the mechanism that's happening in patients who are taking second gen and first gen antipsychotics, right? Uh, this also happens in first gen, so it's kind of a review from the last lecture. Now, when it comes to hyperprolactinemia, in females, you're going to see uh, galactorrhea. They're going to have lactation. Uh, in males, you will see gynecomastia occurring. And in both males and females, you'll see you'll have inhibition of GnRH, which leads to oligomenorrhea in females, as well as loss of libido and impotence in males. Now, this is more common in the first-gen antipsychotics, but you can see it with the, our, a, uh, our apines and idones uh, second generation antipsychotics. Just a little bit of a reminder of the suffixes. Okay, so that is the, endo uh, the endocrine issues. Now, there are still some more adverse effects of the second generation antipsychotics that you need to know, and these are going to be very simple, okay? These are going to be your anti HAM, H A M uh, symptoms. Now, these symptoms are going to be, the first one is going to be the anti-muscarinic effects. Okay, the anti-muscarinic effects occur because you're blocking the central and peripheral acetylcholine muscarinic receptors. And these anti-muscarinic effects are going to uh, present with someone having dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, or just ur uh, urinary retention. Something that's very common with anti-muscarinic uh, or acetylcholine muscarinic receptor blockers. That is something that happens. Uh, with these drugs. The other thing you could have is orthostatic hypotension, which is all due to blockade, again, of central and peripheral alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. This can also be accompanied with tachycardia, but this is going to be more common during initiation and uh, increasing the dose once you have initiated and once someone's uh, well along on their treatment with these drugs. It's going to be perfectly fine. This will go away. The orthostatic hypotension will, us will usually go away. And uh, the, final, the final effect is going to be antihistamine effect, which is going to be blockade of the central and peripheral histamine receptors, and this can lead to sedation. So like I said, the acronym we use or the memory tool is anti-HAM, right? The H stands for the antihistamine uh, uh, activity. The A stands for the adrenergic anti-muscarinic effects. Right, which oh sorry, the alpha one adrenergic effects, which are gonna block the, which are gonna lead to orthostatic hyper hypotension. Okay, so the alpha one blockade. Right, let's put that here. And then finally, the M is gonna stand for the muscarinic or the acetylcholine muscarinic receptor blockade. Okay, so that's what happens. So the anti ham. This can also happen in first generation antipsychotics. Okay, more so in the low potency. Uh, first generation antipsychotics. This is very similar to those. Now, uh, I wish we were done, but unfortunately, we still have one more very important adverse side effect that you need to be aware of. And we've already discussed this, so we're not going to go too deep into it. If you guys want to watch our previous episode about the, the first generation antipsychotics, I highly recommend you do so to get a more detailed understanding of this. But uh, the last or the second to last uh, adverse side effect that can, that can occur is going to be the neuroleptic malignant syndrome, NMS. Now, you may be saying, why am I bringing this up here? It usually occurs in first-gen antipsychotics. You're right. It usually does occur in the first-gen antipsychotics, specifically the high-potency first-gen antipsychotics, but you definitely still need to know that it can happen in the second-generation antipsychotics. It's less common, 
but it can happen. And this is still going to be caused by blocking any uh, dopamine receptor. So anything that blocks dopamine uh, receptors that has dopamine blocking agents in them, along with a genetic predisposition, it can lead to NMS, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So just a reminder, this syndrome can happen at any time, and the timeline does not matter. Unlike the extrapyramidal symptoms like you know acute dystonia, which happens hours to days after starting the drug, and uh, you know the uh, the akathisia, the Parkinsonism, and the tardive dyskinesias that happen a little bit later. Uh, NMS doesn't usually follow any timeline, so it can happen at any point. So this is a a uh, a neuro neurologic emergency, and the symptoms are going to include myoglobin myoglobinuria, rhabdomyolysis, and elevated enzymes. The vitals are going to be uh, very unstable, okay, because they're going through a lot of stuff at this moment. They're also going to have fever and encephalopathy contributing to the unstable uh, vitals. And also, they're going to have muscle rigidity, the lead pipe rigidity. And this is a hallmark indication that someone is going through a neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So I'm going to write hallmark next to it as well as high yield as fuck for you guys so you don't forget this is very important. Now, this muscle rigidity, this lead pipe rigidity, this is a very important in phrase because this is going to be a giveaway for step one is also going to lead to all of these issues the myoglobinuria the rhabdomyolysis and the elevated ck levels are all going to be due to the lead pipe rigidity in the muscles because the 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 muscle cells are going to end up bursting due to that rigidity okay now that is one of the stuff one of the things that can happen and the last adverse effect that you need to be aware of for second gen antipsychotics is going to be qt prolongation now, this can lead to tersod de plants and cardiac death. So you can see right here, we have a little image of these undulating uh, QRS complexes that aren't normal, not QRS, sorry, the uh, cardiac arrhythmias right here. They're not normal. It's kind of in this wave-like waveform. So these are called tersod de plants, and uh, eventually this will lead to cardiac death if it's not taken care of and these patients aren't stabilized. Okay, so this is definitely all the adverse effects you need to know. This is very high yield. And again, just like the first gen antipsychotics, second gen antipsychotics are also pretty dense. Not as dense, but they're still pretty dense. So I highly recommend you guys, you know, go over this lecture, go over this content a couple times so you know this stuff inside and out and you have a good understanding of what's happening. Now, when it comes to the second gen antipsychotics, there's some fast facts you definitely need to know. Okay, so I would personally take a screenshot of this this uh, slide or just take a photo of it, keep it in your phone so you can constantly look at it and remind yourself what's happening. Olanzapine and clozapine are more likely to cause weight gain and metabolic syndrome than any of these other drugs. Okay, that's very, very important. And on the opposite end, aripiprazole and zypra ziprazidone are least likely to cause weight gain. So if you have a patient who's underweight and schizophrenic, you might want to give these patients olazepine and uh, cl uh, clozapine, right? And remember, with clozapine, you need to watch out for their uh, neutrophil count. You have to make sure it's very, very strong. And if you have someone who's overweight, or you know a little bit on the heavier inside with schizophrenia, you might want to give them aripiprazole and ziprazidone. The next drug, risperidone, is most likely to cause the hyperprolactinemia and the endocrine issues. So with risperidone, you want to watch out for a decreased libido in males uh, and impotence. You want to watch out for gynecomastia as well as in males. And in females, you want to watch out for oligomenorrhea and you know lactation, galactorrhea. Aripiprazole is going to be the least sedating, but you have the highest risk for akathisia in this drug because... This is also a partial agonist of the D2 receptor. So akathisia can occur uh, in these drugs. This has a higher risk. And then quietopine is the most sedating drug. The way I, let, I, I always remembered it is that people are quiet with quietopine. I know it's like, you know, misspelled. The E and the I are flipped. But that's how I remembered quietopine as being the most sedating. The olanzapine, this O, I always thought of someone with a really fat stomach. Uh, right, so that looked like O for me. So that was olanzapine. So I I always remembered uh, someone with a really fat circular or O like stomach uh, who takes olazapine, they'll become really fat. Now, um, when it comes to the last drug, clozapine. Clozapine has the strongest antimuscarinic effects as well. So keep that in mind. 
Clozapine is very, very uh, uh, anti-muscarinic, so you're going to have the anti-ham effects like uh, the, the sedation, the orthostatic hypotension, but when it comes to anti-muscarinic effects, you'll see dry mouth, constipation, and blurred vision. Specifically, these effects can occur with uh, clozapine. Now, clozapine, also don't forget the agranulocytosis. I didn't write that, but we're just going to write it here. Agranulocytosis. And they can, you can also have seizures, plus you can have uh, cardiomyopathies. There we go. So don't forget all of uh, the side effects for clozapine. In my opinion, that's probably the most uh, confusing one to remember. Now, with that being said, we are done with the second gen antipsychotics. Thank you so much for listening and watching to this lecture, and uh, I hope this was very helpful. Now, if you guys don't know, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want to watch these videos, if you want to listen to these videos on the go, you can follow us on our podcast. Uh, and we're posting all of these lectures on our podcast, so you can listen to these lectures on the go. So just search Mad Medicine on any podcast service provider, and we'll be able to pop up. Thank you.